Hello, welcome to lesson 6, biology topic 6, inheritance. This lesson is about Mendelian inheritance and is only appropriate for students on triple science studying triple biology. If you are on the combined science pathway, you can miss this lesson out and move straight to lesson 7. For the starter for this lesson, I want you to think about the two genetic conditions that you met last lesson. Just a reminder, my name is Mrs Keenan, I'm Director for Outward Grange Academy's Trust. The first genetic condition you should know something about is polydactyly, the second cystic fibrosis. So I'm just going to give you one minute to write down everything you can remember about those two genetic conditions. Okay, what did you come up with? So some pictures to remind us. Starting with polydactyly. Polydactyly is a genetic disorder where a baby is born with extra fingers or toes. It doesn't usually cause other problems, so isn't life threatening and can be rectified with surgery. The disorder is caused by a dominant allele, so a capital letter and it can be inherited if just one parent carries the defective allele. The parent that has the defective allele will have the condition too, as it is dominant. So any child born to a parent who has polydactyly will have a 50% chance of also suffering from polydactyly, even if their other parent is completely unaffected. The second disorder you need to know something about is cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disorder when the cell membranes produce lots of thick, sticky mucus that clogs up the air passages and clogs up the pancreas. It can result in breathing difficulties and problems with digestion. Because it's caused by a recessive allele, it is inherited only if both parents are carriers and then there is a 25% chance or a 1 in 4 chance of the child having the disorder. Because it's recessive for people to suffer from cystic fibrosis, both alleles need to have the cystic fibrosis problem. And cystic fibrosis is currently carried by one person in every 25. It's life limiting and there's currently no treatment, although treatments are getting better and better, there is still no actual cure. The current life expectancy for someone with CF is around 50 years of age. Okay, our outcomes for today. We're going to describe some of the experiments carried out by Mendel and we're going to look further at genetic diagrams and predict and explain the outcome of crosses using these diagrams. So the first thing I want you to do, and I'm just going to give you one minute, is label the parts one, two, three. You've met all these words before, so it's just a reminder. Make a note of those three labels now, please. Okay, I'm just going to stop you there, you've probably had enough time. So, label number one is the nucleus, contains all the genetic information in the cell. Label two are the chromosomes, and you can see them in the nucleus, but then they're enlarged for label two. 
if we're talking about humans there's 23 pairs of them and they are made of DNA and label 3 shows a short section of that DNA which can be labelled as a gene because a gene is a short section of a chromosome and the genes code for the proteins. Okay, so on your whiteboards, I want you to decide on the eye colour of the following individuals. And I've reminded you that brown is dominant when we're talking about eye colour, so you only need one dominant allele. And blue is recessive, so you need two recessive alleles. So 30 seconds, what colour eyes would the following three individuals have? Okay, quite simple, wasn't it? So big B, little b, there's one dominant allele, so that individual would have brown eyes. Two big Bs, two dominant alleles, so again, that individual would have brown eyes. And last but not least, two small Bs, we've got two recessive alleles, so that individual would have blue eyes. Okay, so some key words then, and I keep recapping these in many lessons because they are absolutely key to this unit. If you can understand the inheritance language, everything else is quite simple. So there's five key words, A, B, C, D, E. Match them to the definitions, one, two, three, four, five. Just make a note, if you think a chromosome is a different form of a gene, just write down A1, and I'm just going to give you one minute. Okay, time's up. So a chromosome then is a long strand of DNA found in the nucleus of cells. A gene is a short section of a chromosome. An allele is a different form of a gene. Recessive needs two of the same allele to be expressed. And dominant only needs one allele in a pair to be expressed. So if you're unsure of any of those words or you've got any mistakes, you might want to pause the video and make a note of them now. Okay, four more then. And again, it's recap, but it's absolutely key. So A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. Same task again. One minute. Let's just double check that we know what these words mean. Okay, brilliant. So homozygous, 
two alleles in a pair that are the same, either both dominant or both recessive. Heterozygous, two alleles in a pair that are different, so one dominant and one recessive. Genotype is a combination of alleles that decides the phenotype, so the two letters if you like, and the phenotype is a physical characteristic the organism has. So in the case of eye colour, the, uh, the genotype could be big B, little b, but the phenotype would be brown eyes. Okay, moving on then. So I've given you a reminder again that brown eyes is dominant. You only need one dominant allele. Blue is recessive, so you need two. So I'm going to ask you, if two heterozygous parents with brown eyes have children, what are the chances of the offspring having brown eyes? I'm going to give you three minutes and I want you to make sure in your answer all six of those bullet points have been addressed. Okay, so time's up. How did you get on? I gave you a little bit longer because you've got quite a lot to do. So, I asked you to put parent one genotype, parent two, draw your Punnett square, complete the genotypes for each possible offspring, write the phenotype in each box, and then work out the ratio this time of brown to blue. Okay, so challenge one asks you, to work out the possible chances of the offspring having brown eyes if two heterozygous parents with brown eyes have children. The key in the reminder box told you that reminded you sorry that brown was dominant. So you've been told that both parents are heterozygous. 
So if we start off just by making a note of mum and dad, remember heterozygous means different. So let's use the letter B. So it'll be one big B and one little B because they are different. The phenotype of both parents will be brown. Remember, phenotype means what characteristic is actually displayed because brown is dominant and you only need one dominant allele. We're going to draw our Punnett square. We're going to put mum's alleles at the top, dad's alleles down the side. Remember, it doesn't matter which way around. We're going to do the crosses. And then we are going to write the phenotype in each box. So this just means what colour of eyes would these offspring have? So for this one, this would be brown, two dominant alleles. For this one, brown, one dominant allele. But for dominant, you only need one. The same here. And the last box, we can write blue. Because it's recessive, two lowercase letters, but no dominant allele is present, so the recessive trait would show. Then I asked you what are the chances of the child having brown eyes? Well, if you do it as a ratio, it's 3 to 1. If you did it as a fraction, it's 3 over 4. But just to remind you from the last couple of lessons, my advice was always to write it as a percentage. So 75% chance of the offspring having brown eyes. Or 25% chance of the offspring having blue eyes. So it's three boxes out of four for brown and one box out of four for blue. Okay, so this slide summarises the video you've just seen. Parent 1's genotype was big B, little b, heterozygous. Parent 2's genotype, big B, little b, again heterozygous. The Punnett square we drew. The genotypes for each offspring were big B, big B, big B, little b, big B, little b again, or little b, little b. The phenotype was then brown, 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 blue. And the ratio of brown to blue was 3 to 1, or 75%. But be careful that if it specifically asks for a ratio, you need to write 3 to 1. OK, challenge 2 asks you, if one parent was heterozygous with brown eyes, and they had a child with another parent who was homozygous with blue eyes, what would be the possible eye colours of the offspring? Again, I'm going to give you three minutes and I want you to work through the six bullet points, checking that you complete each.
Okay, check off the bullet points, make sure you've done everything. Don't forget to write the phenotype in each offspring box and you're being asked to work out the ratio of blue to brown this time. So the number for blue needs to go first, then the two dots and the number of boxes that would have the phenotype brown afterwards. Brilliant. Well done. Let's see how, what you should have come up with. Okay, challenge two asks you if one heterozygous parent with brown eyes had a child with a homozygous parent with blue eyes, what are the possible eye colours of the offspring? So, we've got a heterozygous parent with brown eyes. Hetero meaning different. So we've got a capital letter and a lowercase letter for the genotype. The phenotype is brown. That's what you've been told. And I'm just going to label that as mum. Could be dad, but I'm going to label it as mum. We are then told the other parent, so in my case, dad, is homozygous, so has the same alleles, but this time has blue eyes. So the genotype for dad would be small b, small b. The phenotype would be blue. We know it's got to be small b, small b, because blue eyes is recessive, so you need two recessive alleles. Then you're going to draw your Punnett square. This time I'm going to put mum across the top. I'm going to put dad down the side. I'm going to do the cross. And it asks me to write the phenotype in each box. So we know if it's heterozygous, it will be brown. And it has to be homozygous recessive to be blue. So these two are blue. And another one is heterozygous to brown. So the possible offspring colours which you asked are brown or blue. The ratio of brown to blue, you could put as 2 to 2. You could put brown to blue. If you were asked for the chances of brown, you could say 2 over 4. Or the chances of blue is 2 over 4. But again, I stress how easy it becomes if you use percentages. So in this example, 50% of the offspring would be blue or 50% would be brown eyes. Okay, so to summarise what the video's just said, you had one heterozygous parent, which would have the genotype big B, little b. The other parent was homozygous recessive, so two small b's. You drew your Punnett square. The genotypes you come out with were big B, little b, little b, little b, big b, little b, or little b, little b. The phenotype you should have written in each box starting top left was brown, top right blue, bottom left brown, and bottom right blue. And the ratio of blue to brown was 2 to 2, or 50% blue, or 50% brown. know how you inherit characteristics from your parents. They are able to calculate probabilities of having a specific trait or getting a genetic disease according to the information they have from the parents and the family history. But how is this possible? To understand how traits pass from one living being to its descendants, we need to go back in time to the 19th century and a man named Gregor Mendel. Mendel was an Austrian monk and biologist who loved to work with plants. By breeding the pea plants he was growing in the monastery's garden, he discovered the principles that rule heredity. In one of the most classic examples, Mendel combined a purebred yellow-seeded plant with a purebred green-seeded plant, and he got only yellow seeds. He called the yellow color trait the dominant one, because it was expressed in all the new seeds. Then he let the new yellow-seeded hybrid plants self-fertilize, and in this second generation he got both yellow and green seeds, which meant that the green trait had been hidden by the dominant yellow. He called this hidden trait the recessive trait, 
From those results, Mendel inferred that each trait depends on a pair of factors, one of them coming from the mother and the other from the father. Now we know that these factors are called alleles and represent the different variations of a gene. Depending on which type of allele Mendel found in each seed, we can have what we call a homozygous P, where both alleles are identical, and what we call a heterozygous P, when the two alleles are different. This combination of alleles is known as genotype, and its result, being yellow or green, is called phenotype. To clearly visualize how alleles are distributed amongst descendants, we can use a diagram called the Punnett square. You just place the different alleles on both axes, and then you figure out the possible combinations. Let's look at Mendel's P's, for example. Let's write the dominant yellow allele as an uppercase Y, and the recessive green allele as a lowercase Y. The uppercase Y always overpowers his lowercase friend, so the only time you get green babies is if you have two lowercase Ys. In Mendel's first generation, the yellow homozygous P mom will give each P kid a yellow dominant allele, and the green homozygous P dad will give a green recessive allele, so all the P kids will be yellow heterozygous. Then, in the second generation, where the two heterozygous kids marry, their babies could have any of the three possible genotypes, showing the two possible phenotypes in a three-to-one proportion. But even peas have a lot of characteristics. For example, besides being yellow or green, peas may be round or wrinkled. So we could have all these possible combinations, round yellow peas, round green peas, wrinkled yellow peas, and wrinkled green peas. To calculate the proportions for each genotype and phenotype, we can use a Punnett square too. Of course, this will make it a little more complex. And lots of things are more complicated than peas, like, say, people. These days, scientists know a lot more about genetics and heredity, and there are many other ways in which some characteristics are inherited, but it all started with Mendel and his peas. Okay, so Mendel was an Austrian monk who lived in Vienna. He trained in maths and history, and he lived in a monastery. On his monastery, he had quite a large garden plot, and he grew lots of plants, and he noted the characteristics of these plants and how they were passed on to each other. Now, you've got to remember that Gregor Mandel was working in 1866, so over 150 years ago. A lot of his work has become the foundation of modern day genetics, but at the time, technology was obviously a lot further behind. He studied these pea plants and he noticed that some were tall, some were short, some had yellow peas, some green, some wrinkly, some smooth. And he looked at how those characteristics were passed on over generations. But it took a while for people to understand and accept Mendel's work. And I just want you to think for 10 seconds about why this would be. Okay, so there's many reasons, but the main reason is that his work was cutting edge and new. They didn't have the background knowledge and understanding to fully understand what he was saying. At this time, in the 1800s, they had no idea about genes or DNA or chromosomes. So it was only after his death that people really realised the massive significance of his work. Using Mendel's work as a starting point, many other scientists contributed to the understanding that we have of genetics today. In the late 1800s, scientists were more familiar with chromosomes. They could start to observe how they behave during cell division. In the early 20th century, scientists started to realise that there were massive similarities between chromosomes and these hereditary units that Mendel had talked about. And they started to make the links between these units and the genes as we know them today. But it wasn't until 1953, so 70 years ago, or nearly 70 years ago, that the structure of DNA was determined. And it was only then that scientists could fully appreciate the significance of the work Mandel had done over 150 years earlier. Now, a lot of Mendel's work used the term hereditary units which we would probably now use the word gene. 
So as the technology is caught up and scientists understanding is caught up, these hereditary units have been kind of rebranded as genes. Okay, so when we're talking about the P shape, there are two alleles that control P shape. So this means there are three possible genotypes that any offspring could inherit and two possible phenotypes that could be displayed. So as always, we can have homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive and heterozygous. In the example I've given you, I've used the letter S. So two capital S's for homozygous dominant and the phenotype for the P plant will be smooth. Two lowercase S's, homozygous recessive and the P plant would be wrinkly. And if it was heterozygous, you'd have a capital S and a small s. So 30 seconds, what can we determine about the allele for smooth peas? And what can we determine about the allele for wrinkly peas? Okay, brilliant. So, smooth peas then would have to be dominant because it's got those two capital S's. Homozygous dominant, capital S, capital S. But also, when the individual is heterozygous, the phenotype is smooth, showing that the smooth allele only has to be present on one allele because in heterozygous, the P ends up being smooth. The wrinkly allele then must be recessive, represented with the small s, and you only get the phenotype wrinkly when both alleles are wrinkly, so small s. In the 1860s, Gregor Mendel studied inheritance in nearly 30,000 pea plants. The pea plants can produce either round or wrinkly seeds. He did a cross between plants that are always round and plants that are always wrinkly and he found that all the seeds produced from the cross turned out to be round. Use the symbol A to represent the dominant allele and lowercase a to represent the recessive allele. Which allele must the seeds have? And I'm going to give you one minute to read back through the question and give it some thought. Okay, brilliant. So, the alleles that the seeds from the cross must have must be heterozygous, one capital A, one lowercase a. The reason for that is they are all round, but they inherited alleles from a parent that was all wrinkled. So, one parent must have been capital A, capital A, the other parent lowercase a, lowercase a, meaning that all the offspring will be heterozygous because they can only inherit the dominant allele from one parent and the recessive allele from the other. Okay, so he continued with his work and his crosses produced 5,496 round peas and 1,832 wrinkly peas. Explain why Mendel's crosses gave him these results 
and you need to use the symbols AA and draw a genetic diagram. Now the big clue here is those numbers. Have a look at how those numbers compare to each other. Now remember it's not going to be exact because it's a ratio, it's not a definite outcome. But what ratio of those P's were round to wrinkly and then you need to try and work back from your answer to draw your Punnett square. And this is a really challenging question. So look at those numbers. How many more round P's have you got than wrinkly P's? And then how can you get to that conclusion? Remember capital A round dominant lowercase a wrinkly recessive and I'm going to give you three minutes to have a go. If you are struggling, remember that some of the offspring were wrinkly, so were recessive, so were small a, small a, but a lot more were round, so were dominant. Okay, brilliant, time's up. This question's really difficult because it's asking you to look at the answer and work out the question, if you like, so to work backwards. Now it's told you 5,496 of the offspring were round and 1,832 were wrinkly. So the first thing you needed to do was work out how many times more round pea seeds you had than wrinkly. And there are three times as many. So you've got a ratio of three to one round to wrinkly. So in your offspring, the phenotypes need to end up round, round and round. And one box needs to be wrinkled. Now, if you think about wrinkled as being recessive, one of your offspring boxes has got to come out as two small a's. All the rest have either got to be capital A, capital A, or capital A, small a, so the phenotype is round because it only needs one dominant allele, which is capital A. So, 
You should have worked backwards and determined that both your parents can be heterozygous, one capital A, one small a. Then when you work out the crosses, you get your first offspring which is heterozygous, but would be round because round is dominant. The second possible outcome would again be heterozygous. So one allele is dominant, so round dominant. The third allele would also be heterozygous. One allele is dominant. And the final possible outcome is recessive. So these would be your one set of wrinkly peed, your 1832. Now, if you had done anything else, you wouldn't have got those outcomes. If, for example, across the top you'd put capital A, capital A, the only alleles that the offspring could have inherited from a parent at the top would have been dominant, so all the offspring would have been round. And you wouldn't have got any wrinkled pea seeds, so that wouldn't have worked. In the same way, if you put across the top small a, small a, the only alleles that that parent could contribute would be recessive alleles, and then 50% of your offspring would be recessive. So the numbers would have been 3,664 wrinkled and round. If you'd have had all capitals, obviously all the outcome would have been round, or lowercase letters, all the outcome would have been wrinkly. So by process of illumination, you should have got to this. But the first thing you had to do was look at those two numbers. Think, right, I've got three times as many round as wrinkled. So I need one box to be recessive and the rest to be dominant. Because you've got three out of four that are round, so 75%. And you've got one out of four that's wrinkled, so 25%. And if you add together 5496 and 1832, your total number of offspring is 7,328. Work out 75% of that and you get 5,496, leaving 25% of that as the 1,832 you started with. Now don't worry too much if you struggled with that question. It's higher level, it's a difficult question, but I just wanted you to have a go at it. Okay, finishing this question off then. One of Mendel's crosses produced 19 round seeds and 16 wrinkled seeds. These numbers do not match the expected ratio of round and wrinkled. Suggest why? And finally, the importance of Mendel's discovery was not recognised until after his death. Why? Two minutes, off you go.
Okay, so we talk a lot about expected ratios in genetics, but why do the, num the numbers not always exactly match? Well, it's because we're only ever talking about an expected ratio, or it's due to chance. The chances of having a boy if you reproduce as humans is 50%. But it doesn't mean that every couple with four children has two boys and two girls. Because it's just an expected ratio. It's quite normal to have two sons or two daughters when the ratio is one to one or 50-50. If it was exact, you should always have one of each. But that's not how it works. It's just a ratio. It's an expected ratio. It's not an exact number. The importance of Mendel's work was not recognised for many years after his death. Why? We touched on this earlier. It's because we didn't know anything about genes or DNA or alleles. And any of those words will do. They hadn't been discovered. Or very few scientists actually have gone on to study the same things as him and to read in detail about his work. So the technology and the understanding caught up many years after his death. Okay, with genetics then, we've looked a lot in this unit at Punnett squares. But they can also look like either of these diagrams. And the scientific name for the diagram at the top is a monohybrid cross. So you've got the parents at the top, the possible gametes, and then the crosses. The lines, the arrows, just represent the crossing that you're doing within the Punnett square, but without it being in a table. The second diagram is a family tree type diagram that can have shapes and different colours to represent different things. And I just wanted to look at these diagrams for a minute now so you didn't get caught out if you saw them on your exams. Now this template is often described as a family tree and I want you to draw that template on your piece of paper or on your whiteboard now and I want you to think about what the genetic diagram would look like for the first generation from Mendel's work. Now by F1, I just mean the first cross. So what would the outcome be at the end of those four branches? Then I'd like you to think about, okay, well if it carried on again, what would the outcome be? So you've been told a black square is capital S, capital S, so round P plant seeds. A white square is homozygous recessive, so wrinkly seeds. And if you were to get a heterozygous offspring, it would be a white circle. So I'm going to give you three minutes now. Can you think about what shapes would be at the end of each of those four branches? And can you then go one step further to determine what those offspring in the F1 generation would then go on to produce if they passed on their genes to a second generation? Three minutes starting now, off you go. Okay, if you're struggling to interpret this family tree, 
it's sometimes a good idea to write the genotype next to each individual. So next to that black square you could have written round. Next to the white square you could have written smooth. Then for your offspring, you should have got all of them as white circles. Because if you've only got capital S, capital S in one parent and lowercase s, lowercase s in the other parent, the only alleles that the offspring can inherit from one parent are the dominant allele, the capital letter, and the only allele that the offspring can inherit from the other parent is the lowercase letter or the recessive allele. So all of the F1 generation will have to be heterozygous and in our example smooth because smooth is dominant. If two of those heterozygous parents then go on to produce further offspring, the offspring will be one to four dominant to recessive because what you will get is you will get a big letter and a small letter crossing together and if you just want to draw that as a Punnett square on the side if you had big s little s and big s little s the outcome would be the big s big s big s little s big s little s or two lowercase s's so what you would end up with would be 75% of the offspring would be smooth, whether they are heterozygous or homozygous dominant, and 25% would end up wrinkly because they would only have small s's, recessive alleles. So don't be put off by these diagrams. Draw a Punnett square if it helps you, but sometimes instead of just having shapes and colours, it's useful if you just make notes next to each offspring and you're allowed to do that. Sometimes in exams there'll be numbered and it'll say, what can you tell me about individual seven or individual Y? And you'll have to trace it back. Okay, so we're nearly at the end of this lesson. Again, we've, we've tackled some really tough concepts. If you're struggling, particularly with the last couple of slides, we can get you some more exam questions and some further practice, because this skill is just about practicing it more and more. So for your plenary then, I would like you just to spend a couple of minutes pausing the video and summarising the work of Mendel that he carried out with the pea plants. And I'm not going to set a timer for this because some of you might take five or six minutes, some of you might only take a minute. So pause the video and make as many notes as you can about Gregor Mendel and his work with pea plants. Okay, as always, I've given you a final summary slide. I'm just going to read through it. Then you can pause the video and you can either add to your notes from the previous slide or you can just write it out. So Mendel did inheritance genetic experiments using pea plants. The characteristics in pea plants are determined by hereditary units, which we now know as genes. Hereditary units are passed on to offspring unchanged from parents, one unit from each parent. Hereditary units can be dominant or recessive. If an individual has both the dominant and the recessive unit for the characteristic, the dominant characteristic will always be expressed and the individual will be heterozygous. If they have both dominant alleles or hereditary units, they will display the dominant trait and only if they have both recessive alleles will they display the recessive trait. As well as doing work on yellow and green pea plants and wrinkly and smooth pea plants, he also looked at whether the plants were tall or short. So exam questions can ask you about many different characteristics of pea plants, but the principles behind the inheritance mechanisms aren't changed. So don't be caught out by that. You've done really well this lesson, really, really tough this lesson for triple scientists. 
If you want any more exam practice, please speak to your teacher or go back and try the questions again.